Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel where we talk all things literature, writing, and rhetoric with a heavy emphasis on literature. If that's something that you're into or maybe you just need a little help from time to time, be sure to hit that subscribe button right below you so that you can be notified every time I post a weekly video. And today we're going to tackle some Shakespeare with The Tempest, the last play Shakespeare authored alone. Now, I have always approached this play through the lens of post-colonial theory because this play, in my opinion, is a powerful analogy for the relations between colonizer and colonized, and it explores the effects of colonialism on identity and power. However, keep in mind that this is not the only way or necessarily the best way for you to read and interpret the play. The wonderful thing about literature is that it's open to so many interpretations, so always keep that in mind. Since I approach this play through a post-colonial lens, you need to understand that post-colonialism is a literary theory that considers um, colonial oppression and how this is performed and received, how power and control are used to other, and what all this does to one's sense of identity. So we need to look at how Prospero interacts with those who he others or treats and categorizes differently. Let's start with his relationship with the deceased Sycorax, a woman that Prospero's never even met before, just heard about from Ariel. He says of her, this blue-eyed hag was hither brought with child, and here was left by the sailors. Thou, my slave, as thou reports thyself, was then her servant, and for thou was a spirit too delicate to act her earthy and abhorred commands, refusing her grand hest, she did confine thee by help of her more potent ministers, and in her most unmedical rage into a cloven pine, within which rift imprisoned thou didst painfully remain a dozen years, within which space she died and left thee there, where thou didst vent thy groan, as fast as mill wheels strike. Then was this island, save for the sun that she did litter here, a freckled whelp, hag-born, not honored with a human shape. This is so telling of Prospero's character. What we know about Sycorax, we know only from Prospero's perspective. Sycorax has no agency. She is unvoiced and Prospero is her ventriloquist. She was already dead by the time Prospero arrived here on the island, so all he knows is by hearsay, and Ariel, having been imprisoned by Sycorax for the last 12 years, really isn't the most impartial source. And we need to question why Prospero is telling Ariel Sycorax's story, because remember, it was Ariel who first told him her story. Ariel doesn't need to know this, right? So what is Prospero doing here? He is asserting his power and dominance and vilifying Sycorax. She represents all his greatest fears. There's a reason he tells us that her eyes are blue, because this was a sign of pregnancy back then. And this is how Prospero sees her. He's envious of her because she possesses the one power that his dominance, gender, and magic can never give him, reproduction. This is obvious even when he describes his own troubles as literal childbirth. I think this is one reason why he refers to Sycorax as the devil. I mean, it's ironic, right? When you think about it, Prospero and Sycorax are quite similar. Both were exiled, both practiced magic, though he claims that he's a magician who practices white magic and she's a witch who practices black sorcery. But truly, though, I mean, the only difference is that one man practices magic and one woman practices magic. Prospero claims he's the good guy because he freed Ariel from the cloven pine that Sycorax put him in, but at the same time, Prospero threatens to put him right back into the tree if he gives him any trouble. He's just as inhumane as Sycorax was. Both have one child and both demonstrate rage. Really, Prospero is threatened by Sycorax, which is why he must continuously tell his version of her narrative in order to keep her the villain. She was a woman of power and she's dangerous because her power was not subordinated to the masculine structure of power on which Prospero bases his grievances. In other words, her power is independent of patriarchy and male oppression, the very things that Prospero's power and identity are built on. But Sycorax is not the only figure whose narrative Prospero provides. In fact, Miranda, who is too young to remember what happened back in the day, inquires about her history, but is simply put to sleep by Prospero's magic so that she'll just stop asking. However, now that it's beneficial to tell her everything, Prospero, who, remember, doesn't like their story, reinvents it and tells this new version to Miranda. 
Like Sycorax, Miranda's identity has been created entirely by Prospero. So even if she does something of her own volition, it's really her father's. She is this sort of hostage of her father, a replica of him. And that's why we must question everything that Miranda does and says. For instance, she likes Ferdinand upon seeing him, but we also know that Ferdinand is literally the third man she's ever seen in her entire life. She only knows her father and Caliban, so pretty much anyone's going to look incredibly handsome and appealing to her, right? And it was Prospero's plan for them to fall in love all along, so whether she really likes him is up for debate. Politically, it benefits Prospero for um, her to marry Ferdinand. I mean, Prospero isn't just trying to control the past and the present, but the future, too. This is all happening because Miranda is finally um, at the age of puberty and she's ready to marry. Furthermore, we have to wonder if Miranda truly finds Caliban so disgusting or if she's just repeating what she's always heard from her father. The control Prospero has on Miranda has considerable impact on her. I mean, she's the only female character that we meet in The Tempest, and yet she can't be the representative for women or femininity in this world that is dominated by male figures. Really, she represents a contradiction because she is named as Prospero's daughter and identifies herself with him and his role as the bearer of culture. One of the things that Shakespeare doesn't necessarily explicitly talk about, but does seem conscious of, is the little to no freedom that women have at this time. Freedom for Miranda is just moving from one owner, the father, to another, her husband. By virtue of gender, Miranda is the oppressed, but through her associations, she is the oppressor. As a European white woman, she's in a position to oppress those who are excluded or defined as other by the legacy of colonialism, namely Caliban. Now, Caliban is arguably Shakespeare's most controversial character. He deserves his own video, so I'm going to discuss him as well as Ariel and how Prospero's play turns out in part two of this lecture. So head on over there and join me for that.